emotional bank account. Part five of empowering coupleship. Our goal in this entire series is to enhance couples and relationships, but also in all of this information, almost every concept that we talk about, it's not just restricted to romantic love or marriage love. It is the way God really wants us to react and respond to each other. And so especially today when we talk about the your emotional bank account, that is, we all have one, and we'll get into that, but it, we, we're focusing, there are a lot of emotions, right? We're focusing on the, the main emotion of love as we talk about this, but um, I want to make sure that you understand and everyone understands that this is for couples that are married and been married a long time, for people who are engaged, uh, people who are not engaged, wish they were engaged, people who are dating, people who are not dating, people who wish they were dating and don't have a date, people who are looking for a date, people who are single and happy and, and hate their last date, all, all of those. And so regardless to where you are on that spectrum, when we talk about empowering coupleship, um, the concepts that we're talking about and discussing are concepts ultimately that Jesus laid out. The, t the type of love that we're talking about was really unheard of until Jesus came on the earth over 2,000 years ago. So even in all of Israel before Jesus came, people weren't really practicing the kind of love that we're talking about. And even as you saw in the video where it talks about, uh, you know, loving your spouse as a commitment. When we think of a commitment, we think, okay, I made a vow, and therefore I have to keep my vow. And your focus is on keeping the vow. That's not what we're talking about. If you're focusing on keeping the vow, your focus is on the wrong thing. The kind of love that Jesus is talking about is the kind of love that, that actually comes from ultimately from him and that he expects us to share with each other. We talked about the concept of I owe you me. Remember that when we talked about resetting your expectations and me resetting my expectations of you? And so regardless of who the other person is in the relationship, we're talking about resetting your expectations because we all have expectations. And what we're going to talk about today is what causes those expectations and what happens when, we, when those expectations are not met, but not only what happens when they're not met. How did they get there in the first place and how do you end up creating some of those expectations? So I'm looking forward to today. Today is a fun message for me. It's, I'm excited about it. And our goal here at Grace Transformation Ministries is this. Our goal is to cause you to be able to move through, uh, you know, as one phase after another of progressive life change. And that's whether you're single or married or living with someone, whatever state you're in, progressive life change by connecting you with other people and also connecting you with God but also connecting you with you so that you become comfortable with who you really are. And when we pull all of those three things together, that's when we start to have real relationship, when we can relate openly with each other, relate openly because of who we are on the inside. We're not trying to hide something. And, who know, and how many of you know when we're dating, we're always hiding our worst selves? When we're new... Whether you, even if you're not dating, if you meet somebody for the first time, you're, it's, it's, it's almost like a reaction. Whatever I don't like about myself, I'm going to hide it. And whatever I do like about myself, I'm probably going to flaunt it, right? <laughs> like, this is me. And so we want to help you with all of those horizontal relationships, and it starts on the inside. And we've talked about expectations. And those expectations mostly, and especially today that we're going to be talking about, are emotional needs. What are your emotional needs? If you did not, last week we provided to you, for you on PDF. You can download it from our Facebook group page, which is GTM USA. Well, that's not the Facebook group page. <laughs> that's the website. The Facebook group page is facebook.com forward slash groups and then GTM USA, and you land on our group page. Join the group, and you, have, you can have access to all of the content there. You can download the PDFs that we talk about. And, it's, and also, I provided last week an emotional survey that you can take of yourself and give one to your spouse, 
and we provided some, we print, had some hard copies here, and we have some today. If you, if you need one and want to take one with you, we have some here today. But you need to know what your most important emotional need is, and there's, there, there are a number of them. And so we're going to talk about that today because you need to also understand what happens when my emotional needs and my most important emotional needs are not met. What do I do then when those needs are not met? What do you do with those needs? And we talked about that last week. Well, here's something that's important for us to understand, and that's this. Your emotions and your expectations, your expectations are determined by, now think about this, your expectations are determined by your most important emotional needs. So if you haven't discovered what your emotional needs are and your most important emotional needs, then you probably don't know what your expectations are. So that exercise that I gave you last week will help you to discover what your most important emotional needs are. And sometimes, sometimes we think, I'm trying to figure out how to say that because see, I was raised in church. And I, I, you know, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, I mean, I have generations of church in me, and many of you who are listening to me don't have that kind of background. And so you think because someone like me who's standing here talking about the Word of God is asking you to talk about your expectations and your most important emotional needs, and you're thinking, the things that's on my mind, I don't want nobody else to know. Well, it's just for you. It's not for anybody else to know. Well, and if you're married or if you have a significant other... You need to share that with them and so that it's reciprocal. You can both understand each other's mo emotional needs. But you need to be in touch with your own most important emotional needs. And your most important emotional needs are the potential contents of your love bank. And that's what we're going to talk about today when we say your emotional account. We're talking about your love bank. Can y'all say love bank? My love bank. You know, you usually, you usually like a bank if you got something in it. But if you owe the bank money, then you don't like, you don't like the bank. But we're talking about your emotional love bank. Your most important emotional needs determine the needs of your, or the contents of what's in your, your love bank. And so let's talk about the love bank for a minute. Let's get a concept going here. The love bank, here's, you know, the love bank, every, first of all, we all have one. You have a love bank. Even if you don't want one, you got one. <laughs> we all have a love bank. Every person, every person has an account with every other person that you interact with. So it's not just your partner, not just your spouse, not just the people in your family. Every person that you've ever interacted with they either made a deposit or withdrawal in your love bank. And your love bank is what determines your emotional needs and what you, how you feel. And so everything that you do and everything that you say, everything that you don't do or everything you don't say is either a deposit or a withdrawal in the love bank of the other person, not your love bank, in their love bank. So if you're focusing on your love bank, then everything, anyone else that you've interacted with and that you interact with, whatever they said and sometimes what they don't say. How many of you know you, sometimes people don't say something and it makes you feel a certain way? Well, they, they just made a withdrawal out of your love bank. It's their account in your bank but they made a withdrawal. And when they make so many withdrawals <laughs> till they have a negative bank balance, or especially if they're bankrupt, in your bank they have nothing. You got a negative balance. They owe you. Now you don't even want to be around that person. You don't want to see them coming. And I don't care and let me rephrase that because sometimes when I say that, it makes some people nervous. What's in your love bank 
determines your reaction more than the Bible does. You understand what I'm saying? We, we, we try and take the word and say what we just talked about, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 today, the love chapter, and we talk about what love is. But what comes out of our heart is determined by what's in our love bank. And if someone has so many withdrawals till they got a negative balance, it's hard for you to respond in love. But when a person makes deposits, and this is what's really powerful, when a person makes deposits in your bank, it's hard for you not to respond according to the deposits that they made. But remember, what's a real deposit in your bank may not be a deposit in my bank. It's based on your emotional need. And that's why you need to identify what your most important emotional need is. Yours could be different from mine. J just through research, for example, most men have different emotional needs than most women. And so when we talk about spouses trying to meet the emotional needs of the other, typically what we do is, for example, I think that whatever my emotional needs are, if I can meet those needs in Thomasine, then I think she ought to be happy. But those are my needs, not hers. I need to know where her emotional needs are so that I'm making deposits in her bank. It's my account, but it's her bank. And so what happens is many times, we're married, and see, well, let me back up just a little bit. Because most of the times when we're dating, you know, we, we don't really understand it, but we are, all of our emotional needs are coming to the top. And you are so, if, if you like a person, um, so let me talk about one of the, the emotional needs of a man first. And this, this may be, you may think this is surface, you know, like this, is, this shouldn't be important. But one of the most important emotional needs of any man is an, an attractive woman. You probably never hear another preacher say that. <laughs> but one of the most important emotional needs of a man is an attractive woman. And so if he sees any attractive woman, he's open for her to make a deposit in his bank. Okay? Now, let's say, because when you were dating, you were trying to be attractive, right? Both of you. And that's, I'm just saying that that's one of the emotional needs but not just for men, but women have that need too, but usually it's a greater need for men than it is, you know, a lot of women, they don't care, you know, they're not looking for an attractive man. But, yeah, I see I got some corrections on that. <laughs> so, so it's not just the way we're around. That's why you need to know and you need to rank your needs so you'll know what your most important emotional needs are. Because let's say you're a woman, and one of the most important emotional needs you have is an attractive man. And now, he was all attractive while y'all were dating. And now you get married, and he chewing tobacco and, you know, yeah, ugh, and got all kinds of stuff going on. And, 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 and he wants to kiss you, and, and you're like, get out of my face. And he doesn't realize how important that is to you. And you probably don't either. But you need to have a conversation about it because when he's looking like that, he's making withdrawals. And then when you get to work, and Tom, who works in the next department from you, gets transferred to your department, he's always attractive. But that's not enough just because he's attractive. But then Tom begins to say something to you, and one of your other emotional needs is just a good conversation. 
just the ability to talk. And Tom has no problem talking. But your husband, John, he don't even like to talk anymore, plus he chews tobacco. <laughs> and when you get to work, Tom is ready to have a nice conversation. And he's not chewing tobacco. He's looking good. He's attractive. And guess what? Even if you don't want this to happen, Tom is making deposits in your love bank. And if he doesn't make any withdrawals, his account continues to grow. And if your husband, John, keeps making withdrawals, his account goes down. And somewhere in that account is a romantic threshold. It's like once the account gets to a certain level, it reaches, remember last week we talked about the different kinds of love? The eros is the romantic love. Once there are enough deposits, and everybody's account is different, but once there are enough deposits in your love bank and it reaches the romantic threshold, John is in trouble because you are starting to fall in love with Tom, but you are married to John. And you had no intentions of doing this. It wasn't planned. But John don't know how, <laughs> John don't know how to make deposits in your bank. So you need, you need to school John on what he needs to do to make deposits in your love bank. Or you, your relationship is in trouble. You can, try, you can try hard. You can try. You can, I mean, here you are every day. You're working with Tom. And you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep my vows. I know I'm having these feelings. Because, see, it starts with feelings. You didn't make any plans, but you have these feelings. And your feelings are dictated not by your choices, but by the deposits that's in your bank. You can choose whatever you want, but there are deposits that have been made. And it's too late. So, you want to make deposits in your, if you are married, or you plan to have a life together with a specific person for the rest of your life, you need to learn how to make deposits in that person's love bank. And you need to learn how to not make withdrawals. So you need to know what gets on their nerves, what causes them not to like you and don't want to be around you. And you need to know what, what makes them attractive to you. So the more deposits you make, the better. So their positive, your positive reactions or interactions, those are deposits. Your negative interactions then those are withdrawals. And so when you have negative withdrawals and negative interactions that are withdrawals, and here's, the, here's what's interesting, because you have some people, especially men, they'll think, well, I know I got an account. And this is, we're talking about a married man now, or a person who's in a relationship, and they want to spend the rest of their lives with this person. But they feel like, okay, I made 50 deposits of love, I should be able to make a withdrawal and not have a problem. But here's the facts. Here's the facts. And this is from scientific study, whether you're married or not. The facts are this. If you have a disproportionate negative balance, and it's not necessarily offset by the equal amount of positive interactions. So you can't just make... Now, if you've got 500 love units, and then you do something you think that's worth 10 and that's going to make it down to 490, that's, that's not what happens. It's not a 50-50, you know. And sometimes we, we try to do big things, you know, like let's say you have a blow up and you argue. Everybody have little fights, right? Or even big fights. <laughs> so let's say you had a big fight and now each of you have... They, your love bank have gone down a hundred love units in one fight. Boom. And so 
let's say the husband, he knows it was his fault. He just, he screwed up. And he's learned how to say, hi, honey, it was my fault. I'm sorry. It was dumb for me to do that. I should have respected you. I should have had more, you know, uh, I should have been more attentive. I, I wasn't really thinking about you. And, and then that's crazy, too. Because she's saying, you're right. You wasn't thinking about me. You know? <laughs> and so no matter what you say, it's like, you, and you just keep digging that hole deeper and deeper and deeper. You need to just shut up and <laughs> say, forgive me, please. But even when you do that, and now you say, let's, just, let's go on a trip and, you know, let's do a weekend, just you and me. And every, the whole world is shut out, just you and me. And you think that weekend you're going to make up those 100 love units. You might get 15, but not all 100 back. It takes a long time to build up an account in a love bank. And you know what scientific statistics are? Five to one. I mean, they study couples in the statistics show that it's five to one. So for every, every five good deposits you make, you make one withdrawal and all five of those are wiped out. So it takes five times as much positive feeling and interaction. So if it's feelings and you're having no interactions, you're not really building anything. But if it's feelings and interactions, then between husband and wife, and this is from the study, then that's the, that's the ratio of positive to negative that it takes to begin the bill. So the goal of your emotional bank account is this, to make deposits because that builds trust. And when you build trust, you build the environment for intimacy. And intimacy is the environment where love and all of the other stuff and the understanding and everything else grows. And so here's, here's another goal of the emotional bank account. Never bill, never plan to build like a high positive balance with the intention <laughs> of making a negative withdrawal. Some of, and I'm just thinking about men, some of us men are stupid. We'll do that. We'll figure, okay, I'm going to be real nice. I'm going to do something extra. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting me some points. I'm, I'm building, building up my account because next weekend, I'm not going to tell her, but I want to be with my boys. And, it's, and, he, and he knows it's her birthday, but he wants to be with his boys. And so he builds up a high account and thinks that when he goes out with his boys that he knows it's going to be a negative, but he thinks he's already built up enough to accommodate for that. Eh. Nope. Don't work like that. So don't set goals like building up high accounts so that you can make a negative deposit and withdrawal. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 chapter. Let's get through this. 1 Corinthians 13 chapter. Last week we shared with you the first couple of verses. I'm going to share the rest of it with you today. But the first verse, verse 4 of the 13th chapter says, love is patient, love is kind. Isn't that amazing where it talks about when it just starts to describe love? In other words, whatever is patient for your spouse and your significant other, what the, whatever that means to them, thus what you want to deposit in their bank is what they consider patience, not you. <laughs> what they consider kind, not you. If you're doing something you think is kind, but they don't think it's kind, you're not making deposits. It says love does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. And sometimes we get in a position where we have so much pride where it doesn't matter. You know, I, there's like, there's, there's a line I'm not going to cross. I'm, I'm just too proud. I'm, I got too much pride for that. You're not going to punk me out like that. I'm not, you know, but we need to be like the temptations. Where did, well, you remember that song? I know you want to leave me, but I refuse to let you go. Remember that? I'm not too, 
<laughs> okay, y'all can sing the rest of it. But he's, he, then that song says, I'm not too proud to beg. Not too proud to beg. Sometimes you got to beg. The next verse says, love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Whew. And the next verse says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And I'm putting all of these together, and then we're going to go through them. There are 15 characteristics here. And we talked about seven of these last week in, de in detail. But there are 15 characteristics here. And all of these characteristics boil down to an emotional need that you have or that your spouse have or any, every other person that you interact with have. And you need to learn how to love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, based on your partner's emotional needs or the other person's emotional needs. So it's not just what you think that person needs, but based on what their actual needs are. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. And I call these the four always. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So let's talk about it. And we'll break it down in our challenge. This is our challenge for the weekend. And we're going to talk about these. So your challenge is to make as many deposits as possible. Make as many deposits as possible. Whether you are married in a relationship or you're not in a relationship, but anyone you are reacting with, you want to make as many deposits as possible and to make as few withdrawals as possible. So you need to learn how to not make withdrawals because you're not intending to make withdrawals. So then, and this is how one of the ways you do this, is ask yourself this question. Is what I'm doing or what I'm saying or about to say or thinking, is this going to be a deposit or withdrawal in this person's love bank? Now, if you think about that before you say what you're about to say, or, or if there's a time for you to say something and you choose not to say anything, is your silence a you know, deposit? Or withdrawal. Your silence can be a withdrawal. So then when you look at that, then based on your partner's five most important emotional needs, that's why you need that, you need, you need to get one of those surveys and figure out what that is. You can download them on our Facebook uh, group page. Um, Dr. Harley allowed us to do that. You can, it, I didn't put those together. This is all science. They, he and his wife have counseled thousands of couples. Thousands of couples. And he has come to up with the 10 most important emotional needs among women and men, husbands and wives. And then, based on his, based on his um, research, then he highlights what the five, the most five, the highest most important to men and the five that are most important to women. And that are the typical man and the typical woman. But you need to know what your most important emotional needs are, and you need to know what your partner's most important emotional needs are. I don't, but you do. <laughs> then you modify whatever you're doing or modify whatever you are about to say <laughs> based on their emotional needs. Now, when you think about that, now let's look at what we just looked at in 1 Corinthians. So when we say love is patient, then love never puts pressure on the other person based on their emotional needs. Love allows as much space for that person based on their emotional needs. And the next one is love is kind. Well, love is kind. It's considerate. You're, you're being considerate of that person based on their emotional needs. Love shows careful thoughts, not causing inconveniences. In other words, love is attentive. It's mindful. That means love is not inattentive. How many of you, we, you got, ooh, now I want to ask that question. Um, um, it's easy to be inattentive. It's easy to not pay attention. There are things you should be paying attention to that's important to the other person that you don't realize how important it is, 
And when you don't pay attention to it, then that results in being inattentive. So if you pay attention, you can make a deposit. But if you don't pay attention, it's a withdrawal. Love does not envy. Love admires. Admiration is one of those emotional needs. You may not realize it, but all of us have an emotional need for being admired and admiration. We want respect. We want to feel the respect. We want to feel the approval. And you need to know how important that is to you. Because if you're not getting that from the person that you want it from and someone else is giving you that, they're making deposits. And you don't want that deposit <laughs> to reach that e romantic threshold unless you are ready to have a romantic relationship with that person. Love does not boast. Love never speaks of its own deeds or abilities or self-satisfaction at the expense of the other person. So you, that's a withdrawal. When you're expensing the other person, you're making a withdrawal. Love is not prideful. And we talked about that one. You, you can't be too proud to beg. Love is not engaged in improper and excessive self-esteem that grows in the conceit or arrogance just because of who you are. I mean, it's like you just, you draw a line and say, nope, I'm sorry, that's it, boom. I got too much pride for that. Um, it's over. That's not love. Love does not dishonor. Love never creates regrets. And we talked about that last week. Le love never acts indecently and it always responds in good taste. But love is not self-seeking either. In other words, you're not looking for your own way, your own rights. We all have rights, and that's typically what we think about. When we think, if you're focusing on your rights, then you are probably about to make a withdrawal. That's why you need to think before you say something. And love is not easily angered, starting with some of the newer ones for today. In other words, Love cools the strong feelings of displeasure. We all have been displeased with, if you're married, there have been times when you've been displeased with your spouse. And sometimes that can be, you know, that can be this much or this much or this much. And when it's way out of whack, it's hard for you not, and depending on your, not just your emotional need, but depending on your, your typical way of dealing with things, usually you're going to say something. It just gets to a point where you're going to say something. But what this is saying is that love cools those feelings of displeasure. And that's what love does so that you can respond properly to those. Love does not keep score. In other words, it doesn't keep a list of, like we were saying before, I made these many deposits so I can make these many withdrawals. I should, I should have some space to make some withdrawals. That's not the way love works. Love just wants to make deposits because the more deposits you make in that person's bank, then you are meeting that person's emotional needs. You are meeting that person's most important emotional needs. And love does not delight in evil. How many of you ever said this about your spouse when something negative happens to them? If you're married, you got what you deserve. How many of you had those thoughts about anyone else you've had interactions with? Even if it's a business interaction and then things didn't go good and didn't go well for them. You say, you got what you deserve. Well, love rejoices in the truth. And this is interesting to me that Paul, who wrote this, is, he's, he's comparing or juxtaposing evil to truth. Not evil to good, but evil to truth. How is that? And so when we, to get a real good understanding of that, when he says love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth, truth is bigger than the facts. Truth is really what God says about you. Truth is the real deal of what God expects and what God has planned. That's the real truth. But if you're just looking at the facts, you can, it's easy for you to say you got what you deserve. But remember, truth is also included with what else that we always talk about? Grace and truth. And so when we talk about 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Rejoices in the truth that releases the grace, because everybody can change. But if you start having the attitude that you got what you deserve, you start... You, you build a case for a person never changing and never becoming any better than they are in that situation. And if you're going to live with them for the rest of your life, you, that's not where you want them to be stuck, right? You want them, you want them to increase. And so here are the four always that, that, that I love to talk about, and that is love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, and love always perseveres. Always. Those four always has to be important to us, and we have to make sure, if you're doing this, you're making deposits, but you need to know, excuse me, you need to know what that means to your partner. Is, do they feel protected? That's one of the emotional needs. You know, for, um, in, 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 in the research, women have that need more than men do, but to know that they're protest, protected. The love always trusts, love always hopes, love always perseveres. One of the things when I look at this, these four always, I think of a quote, and I don't remember the name of the person, but it was from some research. I did this a couple of years ago, but this is, they, they researched, they did, they researched all these couples, and the couples that were most happy with each other, this was the phrase that came out of that research, that you've if you find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe it, then that's what causes you to be happy. In other words, when it says love always trusts, love always, uh, give me those four again. Let me back, back that up. Love always protects, trusts, hopes, and per perseveres. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes. In other words, you're, you're hoping for the best. And if, let's say, Let's say you're, I don't want to pick on the women so much, the wives so much. Let's say you're, let's say you're a husband and, and you, you're doing something very different. It's coming up to your wife's birthday and before the big thing you have planned, you, you're going you're gonna to create her most desirous meal, but you personally going to prepare it. And you wanted to surprise her. Well, and she didn't know it was a surprise. So she decided to go with her girls. And you're waiting for her to get home. And she did say she'd be home at a certain time. Even, that's why you planned the surprise. But she didn't make it at that time. And then it's 30 minutes later. And the food's starting to get cold. Then it's an hour later. Now you're wondering, okay, what's going on? And you may not be thinking that, you know, she's cheating on you or anything, but you start feeling disrespected. <laughs> you, you start having these feelings. Well, what we're talking about is when it says always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, it find, love finds the most generous explanation for why she's late and believes it. He said, well, she's probably stuck somewhere, probably ran into somebody. When, when stuff like this happens, Thomasine is so famous, and when she ran into people, she was like, honey, I ran into so-and-so, and I ran into so-and-so, and so and so she ran into three people that she hadn't seen in 10 years, then she's going to be late for whatever. But I have learned to have the most generous explanation and believe it. So here's our action steps, and then we'll wrap this up. So here's our action steps. And this, this is what we asked you to do last week, is download... Dr. Harley's Marriage Builders Emotional Needs Questionnaire. That's what we made available. It's available on our uh, Facebook groups page. And there's a link there you, if you can see it. But it's facebook.com slash groups GTM USA. GTM USA. And files, if you go to the files on that page, you can download the Marriage Builders. It was posted last week. The Marriage Builders Emotional Needs Questionnaire. You can download that there. And then complete that 
emotional needs questionnaire. Then you're set for this week. After you complete that, fill it out, rank it. You know, your most five and your spouse's most five most important emotional needs and review your partner's five most important emotional needs. Then you're ready to do what we're talking about this week. Focus on ways to make deposits in your account in your partner's bank. Then practice taking them to the bank. <laughs> make the deposits. Don't just find out what they are and then you don't make deposits. All right? Make some deposits. So here's what we have coming up for the next couple of weeks. Next week, we're going to talk about coupleship that leads to marriage. So we're going to talk about um, people. We want to create the environment that where we can talk about people who live together and are not married, people that you know, and they still love God, they still, and, but they love each other, and they're not married. And we're going to talk about it from the perspective of ministry and what we believe God is saying and what you, what, anyway, we're going to talk about that next week. And then the next week, we're going to talk about Single and happy. Just because you're single. If you're single and you don't want to be married, that's fine. You can be happy. And most churches, as I said last week, they wonder what's wrong with you if you're still single. You, you, you know, you don't have a girlfriend? Then if you got a girlfriend, then they wonder if you're fooling around. So then they want you to get married. You know, how long y'all been dating? Two years? And so you can choose to be happy and single, and we want to talk about that. So, all right? That's what's coming up for the next couple of weeks. So, if you're here today, and you want to make any kind of move in the direction of a relationship with God, or just becoming better acquainted with us, then we want to make sure that we give you that opportunity to do that. We, if you're in this building with us today, then you can go to our starting point environment, and someone will make sure that you get whatever you need to make that connection. But also, if you're online today on Facebook Live or on uh, Periscope, you can go to, our fa go to our website, which is gtmusa.org, and if you click on Contact and scroll all the way down to the area where it says Contact Us Online, then if you fill out that information, and when I say fill it out, you tell us what you want. If you say, well, I don't know Jesus, I just want more information. Not, we're not saying you're making a commitment, but whatever your level of comfort is for wanting to engage with us, just write that down, fill out that information, and we will get back with you, with you uh, within 48 hours to make sure that we uh, take care of your needs and that your needs are met. So um, bow your heads. I want to pray for you and pray with you about your emotional bank account this week as we focus on that. So, Father, we thank you. You've been so good to us, and we thank you for this series, and we thank you for today's uh, lesson that we're talking about in our emotional bank accounts. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would bless us to focus on the bank accounts of others and what we are depositing in those accounts that will cause them to feel love, to feel the love that you talk about in 1 Corinthians 13, where they can feel protected, where they can feel that love that comes based on their own emotional needs. And we believe that if we do this, God, that the love that you planned and the love that you released on the inside of us can truly be released in them and they can truly feel and experience the love that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good one.